Dunkeld's an ancient, one of the ancient towns. It's got great ecclesiastical history here. Uh, the monks were here. There's an old cathedral here. It's got literary connections I'm going to talk about. But we're just going to take a little scan around the village. Uh, the village did suffer a lot of destruction during the first of the Jacobite uprisings. Um, well, the first uprising uh, with the attack at Dunkeld. And just further north, there's a little village of Killycranky. And so where the Jacobite forces met the Cameronian forces or the supporters of the uh, William of Orange. Um, but we'll talk a wee bit more about that as well as we go along. But just let's take in a bit of the architecture here. We're in the county of Perthshire. Um, so we're in the Highlands. And uh, you're going to get some good views of the River Tay. We'll take you down to the river as well. Um, but I want to talk about, about the, the... You can't talk about Dunkeld without talking about uh, the Duke of Athol. Um, the Athol's famous family here, there's the, the Murray clan and uh, this lovely fountain we have here is dedicated to the Murray. So this is built in memory of the Dukes back in 1800. Uh, a lot of detail in here. Um, when I look at this I always think of the sort of neo-Gothic style of the monuments they did during the Victorian period. Uh, I would think of something like the Scott Monument down in Edinburgh. Uh, I don't know if you can pick up some of the pillars here, but it does bring out some of the flora and fauna of the local area. Um, so we'll just point out some of the stuff here. If you look at this pillar here, you see there's grouse on the top of the pillar here. There's a heron opposite. Come round here. We've got a little red squirrel with this acorn in its hands. Hands. Do squirrels have hands or do they have paws? <laughs> We've got, uh, it looks like a stoat with a rat in its face. <laughs> and come around a little bit further here. We can see a rabbit. We can see eagles. And inside we see these mythical fish as well. And this is dedicated, our memory of the Duke of Athol. So the Athols play a big, big part in here because these lands are all owned by the Duke of Athol. So the Duke of Athol uh, was the only man in Great Britain who was allowed to raise his own private army. And indeed, the um, Athol Highlanders Regiment are the Queen's protectors, or the monarch's protectors, while, they're up here, while she's up here in Scotland. I'm going to take a wee walk around the village square, and then we're going to head up to the cathedral, and we may have a wee surprise for you when we get to the cathedral as well. So let's walk around this back here first. There's some unique little things here that I just love. And we've got some peat being burned in one of the houses here. You can smell the peat being burned as well. So let me give you some literary connections here. Um, Dunkeld and Burnham, we think of them as one little conurbation, two villages next to each other. Now, when I say Burnham, those of you who've studied your Shakespeare, you may have heard of Macbeth, and you may have heard of uh, the three witches for telling Macbeth's future, when he says that the, when Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane. Well, Dunsinane is about 15 miles over in that direction, but we're actually in what would be Burnham Wood. So actually it's mentioned in Macbeth. Now, there's no indication at all that Shakespeare actually visited here. However, there are records of an English troupe of actors being here. So he could have been part of that troupe, but we have nothing official to mark the connection between William Shakespeare and here. But it, Burnham is mentioned. We've just got a question here, Joe. Yep. Uh, the name Dunkeld, uh, mean? That's a strange name. It comes from the Gaelic as well, the old Gaelic, and uh, Dun, Dun, when you see Dun, it really means hill fort. And Keld is a, is a name, is from the Gaelic, it's a name, it's a, a man's name, so it's the hill of somebody. Um, but Dun, prefix, D-U-N, always means a Pictish hill fort, when you mm. see that. If you see the word with a kill in front of it, Kilmartin, Kilmoden, whatever, kill, usually means there's been a church there. So these are the old words that have been carried over from the Pictish language as well. We'll get you the exact meaning of it. So I think I have written it down. I did some research and just haven't got the complete name. But it's a mixture of the, the Gaelic and the Pictish.
So Dunkel became quite famous back in the 800s. It was under uh, Malcolm McAlpin. Malcolm McAlpin is the man or the king who is recognised as bringing Scotland together as one country, so we identify it as a one country. And he made it an ecclesiastical centre here, so we had the monks who came here, and the monks actually established it as an ecclesiastical uh, post here. It became very, very important because during the Viking raids, uh, the most holy saint probably at the time in the 800s would have been St Columba. St Columba's remains were buried in Iona, which is an island on the west coast of Scotland. Of course, that was the main traffic area for the Vikings, particularly, and so easy on the raiding parties. And so to protect the remains of St Columba, they were brought here to Dunkeld. So Dunkeld became a major pilgrimage site. Um, so the first abbey that had been built was made out of wood, but over the years they started to build the stone cathedral, which still stands partly today as well. Let's move up a wee bit further, have a look at the architecture. Just Talk like to say that uh, Dunkeld has got a family connection with me. My uh, granny, my grandmother, uh, on my father's side uh, was a Duncan, and the Duncans were fisher people, and uh, they came from Dunkeld. So been coming here since I was a child. Beautiful, yeah. And also, you have to remember, in the day, in, back in the day, they didn't have any roads here, so everything went by waterway, and so it was on the banks of the River Tay. And so you would get around in, in your coracles or your ferries um, using the main waterway. So the monks would have travelled, the pilgrims would have travelled through Scotland using the River Tay, which is the longest river in Scotland. I think it's about 120 miles long. So it's tiny in compared to other big rivers, but it's the longest river in Scotland, the Silvery Tay. So a lot of these villages here was actually restored back in the 1950s to the 1960s. The, the town fell into a bit of disrepair, as with a lot of Scottish towns with deindustrialization. De this town was famed for its shoemakers, um, so there'd be lots of tanneries here. They would have horse leather, cow leather, sheepskin, the whole thing. And it's said that the town of Dunkeld actually put shoes on all of the Highlanders, if the Highlanders wore shoes in those days as well. There's a lovely little community archive where anybody's got any connections, they can come here and research the background here. I love the architecture of the house. This is so typically Scottish, I always think. You know that expression, living above the shop? This is what I was thinking. So this could have been a tannery here and they would have lived, up, um, lived above it. So going back to the literary connections. The next one I'm going to mention is Beatrix Potter, once we get a little view here. But I'm going to talk about the big building after we've looked at the community archive. So this used to be the old public toilets which have now been converted into a community archive. Lots of green area around here, lots of little parks. And you can do all the research you wish in there. Also, if you want to do some research, they will help you do it. You don't have to go in and do it here. If you get in touch with them, they will do the research for you. So you can go into the community archive uh, here in Dunkeld. This big building here next to it, this was built originally as a school. This was a girls' school. And this is built by uh, the Dowager, Dowager Duchess Anne back in the 1800s. And it's now a community hall and a church hall. And this was built as an industrial school. So, so the girls are being trained to work either in the tanneries or in the mills. So at least the girls could be independent, have some sort of form of independence, and they weren't always dependent on just getting married off. However, back in those days, if a girl did get married, um, they usually had to give up work, which is a bit of a shame. That went on right up till the 1960s, when women got married, they were usually expected to give up their work. So Beatrix Potter has got great connections here to this area uh, when she was a child. She spent most of her summers up here with her family. They were dispatched up here from May right through to August. And it's quite relevant that the latest film that's been released in movies today, because the movie theatres are now open in the UK, and one of the big films that's, that's launching it is Peter Rabbit 2, and this is the birthplace of Peter Rabbit. 
Now we all, we all recognise Beatrix Potter as having connections with Cumbria and Hillfoot, Hill, Hilltop Cottage, but she lived there as an adult. It's when she was a child she came up here. And a few of the characters that, she's, uh, that she has built on, are, they came from connections that she, she knew. One of them, Mrs. Tiddywinkle, for example, we know the hedgehog, is based on a, a laundry woman and the house that she, they stayed in. So they, this laundry woman is supposed to be quite rotund and uh, very jolly. Uh, red face all the time because she was always working in the steam and this gave her the concept of Mrs. Tiddy Winkle. Um, there is a memorial garden to Beatrix Potter in Burnham which is a little village connected to Dunkeld and we will be hopefully having a look at that later on as well. Not on this broadcast but we'll maybe do a little recording in there. We'll pick out some of the characters in the garden and you can have uh, sit back and relax and watch a little bit about Burnham because Burnham and Dunkeld, we would hold them together um, the villages are connected let's have a little walk around again there's something I want to show you about we talked about the community archive but there's something over here that I want to bring Mike over to which I think is quite sweet not only sweet but I think it shows the community spirit now you know that um, we have very iconic buildings here or, or objects or structures one of them being our red telephone boxes there's not you know, we always think it's as British as the British Mini a lot of the telephone boxes a lot of them were actually being stolen and used and taken inside people's houses and people would put showers in them I know a couple of people who tried to buy them in auction and um, to install them in their houses and put them in the bathrooms as a shower to get connected shower into them some of them are used as Wi-Fi areas hotspots some of them got defibrillation packs in them but this one here is so lovely they've actually created a food bank so that citizens can come from the community leave a donation of food tea there's a panettone in there there's different tins of beans and food and orange juice there's also books and tuna sardines and soup so I think it's quite community spirited here. So anybody can come, leave anything here, and anybody can come anonymously. And, you know, people have a pride, and they can actually take what they need, and it will be stocked up by the locals. I think it's just a glorious there's, thing. There's a bit of wood there, even for your fire. There's a bit of log if you were needing it. So, I mean, they think of everything, which is just wonderful. It's just lovely. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. It's a lovely, lovely community-minded little yeah. place. So we talked about literary connections with Shakespeare, talked about Beatrix Potter. Another one I'm going to talk about, which may not immediately come to your mind, is Mary Shelley. Now Mary Shelley, you remember of Frankenstein fame? Well Mary Shelley, uh, her name was Mary Goodwin before she married Percy Bysshe Shelley. Uh, Mary Shelley also came up here to Scotland. She lived in, in Dundee. She was sent up here as an, as an adolescent. I think there are two reasons for her being sent up to Scotland. One is that Percy Bysshe had his eye on young Mary. Percy was married and uh, so Mary's father didn't want him hang her hanging around with a married man. So she could have been dispatched for that reason. Also, she didn't get on very well with her stepmother. So Mary's mother, birth mother, was Mary Wolfham's... I, I can never get her name right. Wolfhamscraft. <laughs> Wilsoncraft. It's Wilsoncraft, yeah. 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 I always want to say Walthamstow, Wilsoncraft, um, the proto-feminist writer, um, but she, her mother died just a few weeks uh, after the birth of Mary. So Mary was brought up um, by a stepmother and she didn't get on well with the stepmother. So she's spent time up here as well, especially in Dundee. But being in Dundee, again, they would travel around and they would travel by boat up and down the river here. And in one of her other books, it's called The Last Man Standing, she actually mentions Dunkeld's because she's visited here as well, so there's a connection there. It's said that when Mary was actually in Dundee, it gave, this is where the idea for Frankenstein actually developed, because she was there in 1812. Now think of what was happening in 1812 here in Scotland. We were having the beginning of the real industrialization in Dundee. There were jute mills, um, there were lots of sailing ships. The war uh, in France was coming to an end, 1812, no, 1812 overture, so we know that Napoleon's forces were in retreat from uh, Moscow. So there was a time of change. She's been sent up here. She's looking at the 
the automatons, or these people from the highlands who were put into these factories, and the factories were these huge mechanical machines were being developed. And this is where the germ of the idea of creating a monster. Whether or not the monster was allegorical in terms of where people were living and work, working, or whether it was actually, you know, something in their head to say, these people that are working in these factories are like automatons as well, because they didn't have much of a life. But Mary Shelley toured around here, and so did when, when she married, or when, when she started to live with uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and they got married, they also went on tour up here together. So, 1812, you're talking about the time of uh, the Romanticism of the Highlands by Sir Walter Scott. Walter Scott's books have been out. He was a, the top author in the English-speaking world at the time. Oh, the rain's gone off, so we can take this down. So he was, he was uh, regarded as being the top author. Um, he was romanticising the Highlands, and the Highlands became the place that people wanted to visit. So all of the great poets would visit here. So we had Shelley, and Shelley's connected with Wordsworth. Wordsworth um, is, you know, they're all connected. So here we've got another, so we've got three literary connections with this little area itself. That ice cream looks good. <laughs> <laughs> I like chocolate chip. You can set me one up. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go over to this little house here. This is called the Ells Shop. Excuse the wobbly um, camera work. At one point there, I had a wasp under the umbrella, <laughs> <laughs> but we're okay now. So <laughs> dealing with the wildlife in the Highlands. Yeah, yeah. So this is called the L Shop, and this is. Uh, I have to say, a lot of the buildings here were repurposed, uh, or, or recreated, or rebuilt through the National Trust of Scotland, and this was the National Trust of Scotland's house here. As if you can see the National Trust emblem up here going back to 1954 when they started to rebuild this little village. And we've also got another symbol up here of the coat of arms of George Brown, who was a bishop here in Dunkeld as well. Now this was the market square. And we mentioned before about where markets, you would go and get your tron, um, you get your weights and measures. Well, this has been one of the areas that have come to measure cloth. Now I mentioned here that this time was really important for shoemakers. And so leather hide was in demand. And you would want to make sure you got the right measurement of leather. So what they would use would be the L. And this is a length of measurement, the L. This goes back to 1706, it's got up here. And so it was a Scottish measurement, standardized at 37 inches long, so just over. So one yard and one inch was an L. And this is how you'd measure your cloth, make sure that you've got the right length of bolt for your cloth or your, or your leather. I was also hearing a connection with elbow, but that would be an awful long elbow. I know. But there may have been some connection with the used to measure cloth with elbow your down. elbows. So maybe, yeah. maybe it could well, be well, the, double. The, well, double. the inch was the, yeah. the, the Romans did it with the thumb, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, there's a Scottish expression, we use, it, we use it in English as well, we say if you give them an inch, you'll take a mile. And the Scottish one was give him an inch and he'll take an L, which is the equivalent of give him an inch and he'll take a mile. So the Scottish measurements got, with, um, got subverted or taken off uh, back in the 1820s when we started to uh, standardise throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. So I'm going to have a little walk up the street here. Now this is a this is Cathedral Street leading up to the cathedral itself. Gorgeous little village here. There's a lovely, lovely little cafe here called the Clutie Dumplin. Now those of you of Scottish heritage will recognise a Clutie Dumplin. Clutie Dumplin was something that your mummy or your granny would make, usually over the winter period. And Clutie is just a Scottish word for a cloth. And a dumpling would be like a big fruit cloth, a uh, big fruit dumpling made for Christmas. Sometimes we used to put um, old money in it. Remember old thruppenny, thruppenny, thruppenny pieces oh, yes, and sixpenny yes. pieces? They would take your teeth out. That's quite dangerous. Yeah. If the sugar didn't get you, the metal coins would get you. <laughs> We've got the proprietor, so we say hello. Hello. And say it's a lovely little place here. How long have you been here in the... We started 24th of January. Oh, hang on, I have to oh, give you, you a... We won't hear you until yeah. we get a... 
a microphone to you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Rahul, oh, yeah. Uh, we started 24th of January 2020. Uh-huh. So, um, so we've been having a fabulous time serving people Thompson's coffee and Clutty Dumpling. Um, my wife makes everything, so it's all fresh. It's all fresh and homemade. And I can, I can testify to that because I've just had a, a savoury tart and soup, and homemade popped, soup. I popped them for a latte as and well. And a cat a latte as well. Yeah. Yeah. Outside. yeah. So what's your name? Uh, I'm Mike and uh, my wife's Jacinta and we are the Clutey Dumpling. The Clutey Dumpling? Yeah. And I saw some art on the wall and so your wife's... Yeah, my wife does the art. Yeah, she's, yeah. Um, she does all the paint and she's done some cars and she did a little book as well. So um, the Clutey Dumpling recipe is actually my mum's recipe. So... It's, uh, I think it's quite an old, quite an old recipe. So. And you can't give us that because if you have gives it, you have to kill us. Aye, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you, but I hate to kill you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You never pass on a recipe for a clue <laughs> dumpling ever. It's always kept in the family secret. Yeah. Do you, did, did your mum ever put um, money in it? Yeah, well, there was one good story. There was a, an old gentleman came in one day. You would always get your money in on your birthday, but quite early on, as a, a, a gentleman came in and he came up with face of thunder and he says, I want to complain. And I said, oh dear, what's the matter? He says, there's no silver sixpence in my clutey dumpling. <laughs> <laughs> well, you always expected money in it. That, yeah. was, that was all the reward for it. We all remember that. Well, thanks very much for your Thank time. You and there's a lovely little uh, garden as well, haven't yeah, you, inside? a little garden that looks onto the river. Yeah. So, um, welcome to anyone. <laughs> okay. Well, you've got a Highland welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank thanks you. very much. Thank you. So we mentioned the monastery that was built here. And we mentioned how they used to use the river um, for access. So this is actually the little area where the monks would take or make access, bring in the supplies from the river. I'm going to take you down to the river, down to the River Tay, the Silvery Tay. So we're actually going down a wind. You're all familiar now with the wines, the W-Y-N-D, if you remember one in St Andrews, it's called Butts Wind. Butts Wind, <laughs> yes, I remember people, that. People never forget I'll that never one. never forget it now. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to say a little aside because uh, my dad's second cousin still lives in Burnham across the river and she's a keen fisher person, I nearly said fisherman. Yeah. And uh, at the beginning of the year, at the start of the salmon season, they come here and uh, they have a pipe band playing the bagpipes, leading the fishing people down with their fishing rods down to the river. And to make sure it's a good season, you know what they do? They throw whiskey, in a bottle of whiskey, they pour it into the river Tay for good luck. Well, that now, makes is sense. Is that a good use of yeah. whiskey, do you think? <laughs> well, yeah, the fish like it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And if the fish bite? Any whiskey aficionados would uh, definitely disagree. So. Yeah, and it is, the Tay is an important um, salmon and trout river. Um, this area used to flood quite a lot, but further up in the reaches, they have built a large hydroelectric dam up in Pitlochry, which is the neighbouring town, or the next town up. The next town up um, is, a, again, a great place to visit. Pitlochry is another ancient town. But when they were building the dam... They knew that the fish had to go back up the river to spawn, so they've actually built a salmon ladder, and you can go into the hydroelectric dam and watch the salmon migrate up step by step by step by step, and it is spectacular to go and see it. So this is the River Tay. I think a lot of our viewers are enjoying the view here. It is yep. uh, beautiful today, and there's a bit of blue sky even coming through. Oh, and you can see yeah. you can see now we are in the Highlands. It's, it's yeah. opening up, the hills are opening up, the mountains are opening up. And you can imagine um, back in the early days before this bridge was opened, this, this bridge is a Telford Bridge, Thomas Telford. He was known as the Colossus of the Roads. Um, great Scottish engineer. He has lots of bridges all across Scotland, all designed and engineered by Thomas Telford. And um, Tom Telford is also responsible for the development of the Caledonian Canal, which connects the Atlantic to the North Sea, which actually cuts right through the centre of Scotland. However, this bridge was actually commissioned by one of the Dukes of Athol, and it caused a bit of a problem, because he was given money from the government to help build it. But, you know, the rich being the rich, he decided to put toll gates on this. So he was charging people... But the locals did not like that. You know, you know what the Scots are like. You know, we're, we're, 
we don't sit back quietly. And uh, so there was lots of protests were arranged. And in fact, actually, they had what they're known as the Dunkeld Riots, where the locals would go to the bridge, take down the toll, toll gates and throw them into the river. And this went on for quite a while. In the end, the Duke had to give in. So one evening, him and a party of his men went up, they took the gates down themselves and they threw the gates into the river. So not a penny was paid in toll ever again because the locals decided to take democracy into their own hands. So I hope you can hear the birth song as well. There's quite a lot of it just now. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. I said, the only thing that's missing at the moment the midges, and there's none, which is great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, there are lovely birds there. So yes, a very, very important little town here in terms of its history. Um, also, um, back in the 1689, uh, the King James the Seventh of Scotland uh, was being deposed. His nephew and basically his daughter's husband William of Orange uh, was being brought over to depose James now the Jacobites remember the Jacobite the word Jacobite comes from Jacobus Jacobus is Latin for James so the Jacobites were the supporter of James James was being sent into exile but there were two battles that took place. This was the very first uprising, the Jacobite uprising, started in 1689. The first battle actually took place just north of Pitlochry, in a little, I wouldn't even call it a hamlet, but in those days it would mainly be a field, but it was known as Killy Cranky. And there was a very famous battle there. Uh, the battle was led by, on the Jacobite side, a chap known as Bonnie Dundee. And Bonnie Dundee lost his life at the Battle of Killycranky. The troops of the supporter of William of Orange, his troops were known as the Cameronians, the regiment. And that was established by people who supported the Covenant at the time, so ultra-religious Presbyterians. And they retreated here to this village troops came down to meet them again, only a matter of weeks after the battle of Killicranke, and they actually fought hand to hand in these houses that are left here. There's a few of the houses that are original, and we'll point them out to you. But the battle was so bad that some of the people, some of the citizenry, and some of the soldiers had taken refuge in the houses, and they burnt them down with the people inside him. It was a savage, brutal affair and it ended in a Jacobite defeat. So, two battles, a few weeks apart and it was one each to the Jacobites and to the government. Now, I want to point out this little house here. So, for all the Canadians who are with us, the first Liberal Prime Minister of Canada, Alexander Mackenzie, Number 9 Cathedral Street, this was his childhood home. So we've even got connections to Canada. Now there are also some musical attachments here. I'm sure some of you will have heard of Dougie McLean. Dougie McLean penned, which probably would be regarded as the unofficial national anthem of Scotland called Caledonia. If you ever went to want to make a Scottish person cry, put Caledonia on the, uh, on the turntable, especially if they're living in a different country and they will burst into tears. Now, Caledonia was the name that the Romans gave to Scotland, if you remember, we discussed that before. And Dougie McLean wrote that song, Caledonia. And if you've never listened to it, download it and listen to it. And I'll tell you what, it's a lovely tune. And you'll hear it sung at s some sporting events as the alternative national anthem. Now we have Scots Wahey as well, which is always, there's another one that they all sing as well, um, especially at the rugby matches. Um, Flower and Flower of Scotland yeah, yeah. as yeah. well. So we've got so many, so many different little anthems, but I always think, for me, 
the most emotional one is Dougie McLean. And Dougie McLean lives in this particular area here, and he set up um, the arts festival that takes place here in Dunkeld as well. So him and his wife are very important characters here. We've also got Neil Gow, who was a great fiddler, and uh, he was brought up just across the river as well. So lots of literary connections, musical connections. And I just want to point to this one here. We talked about the battles that took place here. Now, this towns were fought over. So we talked about the Jacobite First Rebellion, but even before that, remember our great friend, Oliver Cromwell? Remember, he visited us as well. He also laid waste to some of the houses here, and this is one of the original houses that survived the damage from the parliamentary troops. So when we talk about the parliamentary troops, they're talking about our good friend, Ollie. Ollie Cromwell. Now, I think in terms of reconstruction, this has really revived this whole town. I think the white uh, houses too is so uplifting uh, and uh, it's very kind of highland, even west coast, but although it's not in the west coast, but it's got that uh, flavour about it. I just love it. So picturesque with the white buildings and especially with the greenery as well. It's just really so, nice. It's so yeah. well preserved and as the community spirit here is second to none. I think it's great. Um, another literary connection we have coming up. Um, there's a couple of houses here. This is the original Dean's house, so this would be the Dean Cathedral, and this is one that survived the battle. Very, I say, the only three houses in the whole village survived the Battle of Dunkeld in 1689. The old rectory. So this would be the man's, and I've mentioned the fiddler Neil Gow. Also our famous poet, Robbie Burns, um, both of whom entertained in here, well, Burns entertained in here in 1787. Now we're going to change over now because Mike is going to take, you, take us into the cathedral. Now Mike almost committed a big mistake. We, ha we have a superstition here in Scotland. You never walk around a church in an anti-clockwise direction. Never. It's called Widdershins, W-I-D-D-E-R-S-H-I-N-S. -S. It is bad luck to walk around a church anti-clockwise. And as we approached here, Mike immediately went to the anti-clockwise, and I was going, no, we don't do that here. <laughs> Mike didn't know that. So today was a learning day for Mike as well. So there's a new word for you, Widdershins. I was speaking to another friend the other day, and she was on the phone and she said, what's that Scottish word that you have? Um, you know, when it's, uh, it's the, the, the sky's really heavy and it's raining and it's really dull. And she said, there's a really, really, there's a, oh, what's that special word? And I went, summer? <laughs> <laughs> she meant dree, of course, dree. I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, we have got a bit of blue sky just now, which is nice. And it's getting a bit warmer. When I say a bit warmer, it's probably about 12 degrees, but... Uh, we're quite happy with that. Uh, so, I'm just going to walk uh, through the gates of Dunkeld uh, Cathedral here. You may be surprised to hear that it's a cathedral in such a small settlement, but uh, it has a huge history in the religious history of Scotland. And you're looking now at the eastern limb, and uh, this dates back to the 13th century, believe it not, and various uh, bishops have had a hand in its construction. It took hundreds of years, really, for uh, these buildings to develop. Mike, I've just got a question. How do you spell Dreich? D-R-E-I-C-H. Absolutely. That's D -R -E -I -C -H. it. Spot on. D-R-E-I-C-H. <laughs> Dreich. I think the Scots have got so many great descriptive uh, words, which is absolutely... Sum Ono it up. Onomatopoeic. <laughs> Just want to get a view of the mountains over there. With the... Yeah, we're on what's called the Highland Boundary Fault here. We're in the Highlands. And, uh, of course, the scenery changes from being a bit more undulating and smooth, round about Edinburgh and so on, to being a bit mountainous. And it's all to do with geology. I won't go into any detail on that one, but uh, there is a distinct change in the landscape. And uh, you can probably see it. This is just pointing over there. You see the rocky uh, hills 
Uh, and if you go further north, up in that direction, it gets even more mountainous. And then if you go the other way, that way, south, it tends to smooth out a little bit. And that's what makes this place so beautiful. It has got such a contrast. Uh, going back, uh, Joe was talking about the Battle of Dunkeld in 1689. Uh, this uh, was a very different scene. Around the cathedral it was uh, very much hemmed in by buildings. And of course the devastation at the Battle of Dunkeld uh, resulted in many of the buildings being destroyed because uh, the Highlanders, the Jacobites, the followers of James VII, uh, who was a Catholic monarch, who'd been kind of was getting kicked out uh, from the monarchy in England. Uh, they were still holding on to him, supporting him. And there was a standoff between the government and the uh, Jacobites, as they were called, uh, or the more Catholic leaning people. And what they did, the government, when the battle shifted here from the Battle of Kilikranke, which was a victory for the Jacobites, uh, they hadn't, uh, the government wasn't happy at all. So uh, the Cameronians, who were a covenanting leaning, a unionist leaning uh, regiment, a Protestant leaning regiment, uh, they ensconced themselves here and there was a standoff between them and the Jacobites and 300 Jacobites locked themselves up in the houses here and the government troops locked the doors of the houses and burnt the houses down. And there was at least 300 Jacobites killed and of course it was a major victory for the Cameroonians and for the government against the Jacobites. So the writing was on the wall even going back to the 17th century that the, that uh, group wasn't going to be too successful. Now if you look here, this is what we call the choir. Uh, this would be the very hyper-religious, very sacred part of the building and any cathedral would start from the east end and this is eastern part of the building and they would uh, develop it towards the west end. And at the east end would be the relics, the holy relics. <coughs> and there's been a religious site here, probably as far back as about the 5th century, believe it or not, St Ninian brought Christianity to Scotland before St Columba did in the uh, uh, 6th century, and there was a monastic building here. And there's not very much of that, only a few what we call Pictish stones, which date from around that time. So there was a religious settlement here. It was a very favoured place, and they were called the Culdees, C-U-L-D-E-E-S, and they, that meant servants of God. So it became the top ecclesiastical administrative centre here in Dunkeld um, before St Andrews got that tag. They were always wanting to turn it back into a monastery, but the way it went, it was a secular, what we call, bishop tree, where the canons here got out into the community. They didn't actually lead a life of seclusion, although they did follow the worshipping procedures of monks, but it was a more uh, secular situation. But anyway, this is the eastern limb, dating from the 13th century, as far back as that. So it's quite awesome to see that. And a uh, little side door here for the people. Now, what, what is really interesting about this is this today is a parish church. It's a Presbyterian parish church, and you can see the roof is still on it, uh, and it's uh, very beautiful inside, and it is for the local Protestant worshippers who still use this church today. And uh, going back after the Reformation, when th they threw out Catholicism and many buildings were destroyed, well, this building did get a bit of destruction. They took the roof off uh, the nave, which you can see uh, when we go more to the western side of the building and it was a local landowner but also the roof suffered because they were using the lead of the roof for lead shot during the Battle of Dunkeld and because it was such a remarkable standout building the government troops, the Cameroonians, used it uh, as a base and the tower, of course, would have a great uh, position high up so that they could see where their opponents were hiding. So we're moving down and you can see there's a lot of restoration 
and preservation going on here because this is a 15th century building. Uh, it's uh, incredible, most beautiful. Now, I'll tell you a wee story. The, Joe has been talking about some of the local characters and you may be familiar with Outlander, you may be familiar with Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Jacobites, the romantic heroes of Scotland, trying to bring their, their king back, the Jacobites, well. People sometimes ask me on tours, is there anybody who holds the position of making a claim to the crown of Scotland? Now we know the Queen, of course, she's the monarch of Scotland as well, and uh, as well as England, but what happened was Bonnie Prince Charlie fled Scotland with the help of Flora MacDonald. He went back to Italy, to France, and uh, he had a mistress, Scottish mistress, called Christina Walkinshaw, and they had a baby, Charlotte. And Charlotte uh, also had some children, and they technically were the grandchildren of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Now, they would have loved to have made a claim on the Crown of Scotland, but the only thing <laughs> here was that uh, Charlotte's um, partner, uh, they had children out of wedlock, so the children were all illegitimate. And one of these children was called Count Charles Edward Stuart Rohenstadt, and he was the illegitimate child of Charlotte, who was the daughter of Bonnie Prince Charlie, and also the child of the Archbishop of Bordeaux in France. And he was making a claim to his position as a direct descendant of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Many people didn't believe him. He, was a, he had a habit of making enemies very easily because he was very aware of his importance. And he was in the Russian army at one point, he was in the Austrian army, he had quite a colourful career and he mixed with the rich and powerful. And he, what he was really after was the dowry of Mary of Medina. There was some money around, if you could actually claim descent from James the Seventh of Scotland, who was James the Second of England, there could be a bit of money because Mary of Medina was uh, James VII's second wife and he was touring Scotland was Charles, Count Charles Edward Stuart Rowanstadt. He was visiting the Duke of Athol here uh, just behind this uh, cathedral and he was returning uh, home when he was in a coach accident. The coach overturned it lost a wheel and uh, Count Charles died. And the grave is actually in the nave here of the western part of Dunkel Cathedral. So that actually answers the question, maybe, because people often ask me, are there any descendants? Well, if you look on the internet, there's lots of uh, connections with different monarchs in Europe today, but that was the most direct connection. There were two people called the Sobieski Stuarts around at the same time who were fakes. They were pretending to be direct descendants of Bonnie Prince Charlie because there was a lot of money and power and prestige if you could claim that. But they were at it. They were fraudulent. And they actually had connections with some of the fake tartans bringing a big book of tartans which they said was very authentic. So they were very commercially minded. But that man today, Charles Edward Stewart, and it's one of the hidden gems, I think, of Dunkel Cathedral. You know, it's just amazing to think that, yeah. When I was in Spain last year, I was down in the south, I was in Seville and the neighbouring towns, and there was a Princess Dalba, or the Duchess Dalba. Um, so she um, had Stuart in her name, and she died. She was one of the wealthiest women in Spain. She died, and the sons who inherited have retaken the Stuart name, so they've brought that to life as well. So there's just a claim of the Scottish lineage down in Spain as well. And there might be more of that because of uh, there so is many a move. Children. There, there is a move <laughs> by many people. About 50% of the 
Scotland, they say at the moment, is in favour of uh, independence. So, so who knows, we may get somebody coming out of the woodwork and saying, I am your true king or queen. Yeah, but do we want one? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the present Scottish government are in favour of the monarchy. So that no, might I don't not, think a lot of Scots are in favour of the monarchy. I'm not a lot of Scots either. No. Yeah. So we're coming around the west front of uh, Dunkel Cathedral, and this dates back to the 15th century. And one of the bishops here had a huge influence on the architecture. He was called Bishop Lauder around in the 15th century. And uh, he was extending the church. So you may wonder why such a gap from the 13th century, which was the choir, the East End, and now we're ending up at the 15th century, right? So what about, uh, well, what about the 14th century? What happened to that? Well, that was the time of the Wars of Independence in Scotland. Uh, we were having various standoffs with the English, so that put a bit of a hold in the development of this cathedral. But then again, of course, it took off in the 15th century. Now, if you look here, uh, this bell tower, normally you can get in here. And there was a little courthouse in here. And it was for uh, taking to account local residents who were maybe... Um, perf doing various things, we won't go into too much detail, doing various illegal things and immoral things and they would be held to account in this little room under here and there are ancient murals on the wall uh, which are all to do with uh, honesty and loyalty uh, to your husband. Um, so the bishops would have huge power, they have secular power, they would have not just religious power, they would be able to determine how people lived their lives back then. It was quite, quite scary. But you can normally go in here, and in here too are some of the ancient Pictish stones. Remember us talking about this being a Pictish ancient settlement from the 5th century, where we have got some ancient uh, sculpted stones in here, which you can see in normal times when this little room is open. I'd like to take us back a bit so we can see the architecture of the West Front. Now, it is very strange. We'll move back a bit more so that we can probably see the top bit a bit better. And if Joe can capture the top bit, if you just notice there's something not right there. It's out of symmetry. And if you look at the big west window, notice that it is pushed over to the side, to the left-hand side. And if you notice, the little window above it, circular window, which should be absolutely centred and above the west window, is pushed off to the right-hand side. Now, this was because the architect, under the direction of Bishop Lauder, was trying to achieve everything. But note, there was a tower on the right-hand side uh, which was going to make it very difficult to get everything symmetrical. So one of the other kind of uh, easily missed quirky features of the west front of uh, Dunkel Cathedral and the west door that uh, we are seeing here is all bolted and barred because it's uh, unsafe in there. It's going through restoration. Uh, this was the privileged, the high up people in the hierarchy of the church who would enter by this door here. The public. So this would be, be the grand processional. Grand processional door, that is right. And uh, it would be very elegantly sculpted all around there in different tiers. Uh, the door for the public would be on the south of the church. And I think we just passed that on the way around here. So you were not allowed to go through this big processional door. And the whole place is full of yew trees. And yew trees have a special place in religious and Scottish mythology as well. Yes, yes. So it's all most of the yew trees. Uh, which brings us on to the National Arboretum. Yes, yeah. Because this is part, this whole area of the Atoll Estates is part of the National Arboretum. And pre previous Dukes of Atoll uh, took their turns in actually developing 
the I mean this basically was deforested the whole area was deforested for, for years um, but they took upon themselves to reforest the whole of this area and it is now yeah. part of the National Arboretum and Mike's going to talk a wee bit about the larches which are yeah we've uh, got here the <clears throat> one of what we call the parent larches now the larches were not native to Scotland the larch tree they were I think they were brought from Denmark were they Joe I think I some place in Scandinavia yeah. um, and the Dukes of Athol were very keen on landscaping and uh, this could be described as big tree you know big tree country in this part of Persia where we are in at the moment so we can see here is the larch one of the few remaining of the original seedlings uh, that it grew from what the Duke of Athol brought here and planted and he had thought that this wood was going to be a big winner particularly in boat building but unfortunately it never took off so we can see it today uh, just here and uh, it's easy, way to, easy to miss it there is a, a sign in front of it but that sign is uh, a bit there, the worse for wear. There were five originals, so this is the only one that's left standing. Um, oh, there's a lovely little bullfinch just above your head there, Mike. There's what, sorry? A bullfinch just above bullfinch. your head. Bullfinch? Wow. You see it? Oh, I see it, little yeah. Pink one. Um, uh, it said that one of the previous Dukes of Athol, when he was looking to repopulate this whole area, that he would hollow out cannonballs and he would put the seed in the cannonballs and fire the cannonballs into the hillsides and to help repopulate all the, well, the, the, with the new trees, which is yeah. quite a unique thing of doing, I think. It's quite innovative. It is. Persia is one of the most beautiful uh, counties in Scotland. Uh, it has got it all. It's got wonderful rivers, it's the River Tay, it's got fantastic woodland, it's got wonderful mountains, it's got fantastic picturesque towns, and uh, well worth visiting. And many people, when we are guiding, sometimes we don't come into Dunkeld because the itinerary is Edinburgh, maybe a stop, comfort break at Pitwachry, and then head on up to Inverness. But this is missing a lot of the culture, history and beauty of this part of the country. And this tower, the bell tower here, it had quite an important uh, position in the battle of Dunkeld and if you look carefully there are uh, poke marks of musket balls all over it because it was the ideal position for the Cameronians because uh, they would be right up the top of that tower firing down on the Jacobites. And the Jacobites were just stationed in that field just there. That's where the Jacobite camps were. Just there. Just there yeah and uh, the the manor house of the Dukes of Athol, uh, the one that was there, is no longer there today. Uh, they made various attempts to rebuild it, but uh, there is a hotel further over there, which is a very nice hotel beside the River Tay in the grounds of uh, the Athol Estates. If you look on the, over here at the outside of the nave, uh, the nave, of course, down the centre, with aisles on either side, and remember in here, it's uh, Count Charles Edward Stuart. Ronstadt is uh, buried in here, but also Lieutenant Colonel Cleland, who was the leader of the Cameronians in the Battle of Dunkeld, and uh, he got shot, I think through the heart and through the liver, and died, and uh, his remains were interred here at Dunkel Cathedral as well. So Bonnie, Bonnie Dundee, the leader of the Jacobites, got killed in Killicranky, and Clayland, the leader of the Loyalists, um, got killed at the Battle of Dunkeld. That's right, yeah. It was, you may wonder why did all that happen here? It was because it was on the Highland Boundary Fault, and it's a very thin, uh, narrow access from the Lowlands to the the Highlands, which passes through Dunkeld. So again, it's a bit like Stirling Castle. If you held this part of Scotland, then you held great power because it was a very important thoroughfare uh, to go through. So we're just going to carry down the other side 
and I'm so glad that I'm going round in the clockwise direction. Yeah, you never <laughs> ever go round a church anti-clockwise. No. Forsooth, one should have an innate sense of these things. We should, but some people <laughs> to don't. Quote, to quote Dean Brody. <laughs> um, I was going to give you a little bit of a gossip story as well, Mike, about uh -huh. the Duke of Athol as well. Okay, well, uh, um, before you do, yep. I'm just going to point out uh, an e another easily missed uh, feature. And here, again, we've got uh, this bit sticking out, which was originally the chapter house. Uh, it would be where the day-to-day -day business of uh, the people would be discussed because you would have all these rectors and treasurers and all the people who would do, be to do with running the cathedral would meet every so often in the, the chapter house and it's a 15th century chapter house and it was also used as a sacristy so on the bottom floor was where the meetings would take place but they would have another floor up the sacristy would be where the very uh, expensive uh, very oh, what's the word I silverware think. The silverware, <laughs> the gold, <laughs> all the church ornaments, yeah. goblets, plates, you name it, crucifixes encrusted with all sorts of expensive, and valuable materials. And where they kept the monstrance. They would have to be kept in a very safe place up above here, uh, which was called the sacristy. So you've got that double use. But today, visiting inside, which you can do, uh, you will see this is a cathedral museum. Uh, which is used that today. And finally, before Joe tells you this little bit of stuff about the, the Murrays, you will see a shield. And it's very much the worst for wear, but this shield was the coat of arms of Bishop Lauder, who happened to be the bishop in place when this uh, chapter house was built. So we do have a little treat for you. So we're going to finish off a little treat. We're going to go walk down to the river. Um, and the treat is, because we're here in a Highland Cathedral, Mike is going to play Highland Cathedral on the pipe. So as we're walking down, I'm going to give you a wee bit of gossip from the Murrays. Yes. So the 10th Duke of Murray, um, sorry, 10th Duke of Atoll, Murray, died uh, without any sons. He was regarded as being the most eligible bachelor in the area, very, very wealthy. I mean, not just in the area, in the whole of Great Britain, he was extremely wealthy. Um, but he had no sons, he didn't marry. Um, it was a big, big noise in the Conservative Party and uh, very well known in all of the grand houses throughout Britain, Scotland. So daughters were being thrown in front of him, basically, to say, get that one married and get in there. However, he didn't marry. So. He had no one to take over his wealth. So the only people who were going to take over the wealth were his second cousins who were based in South Africa. Now Murray didn't like his South African cousins at all. So in his deathbed, he handed all of the estates, all of the money, everything he had, over to a charitable trust to make sure that the South Africans never got their hands on the money. The only thing he could not prevent them from getting was the title because the title is a noble title and it's not his to say yay or nay it was done basically to spite his South African kin and to this day the South Africans uh, the one who inherited it Duke number 11 said well I'm a South African I'm not a Scot I'm not interested anyway so nowadays you can go into the castle Blair Castle uh, which is the house of Murray and it's open to the public and thanks to him it is open to the public we can get in there so he does he did a civic duty and he gave the holy state to the people of Scotland <laughs>
There we go. Well done. That was uh, chilly cranky. Thanks very much for watching, folk. Uh, folks. Uh, we love being here. Follow us. Like us. We have got a YouTube channel. And you know, we've made 500 uh, subscribers. What we'd love to do is make a thousand. So subscribe. Subscribe. We'd really appreciate it if you we did would, subscribe. It's we great. would love it.